Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Stacy, and I'm a bookseller and the events coordinator at Belmont Books. Belmont Books, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is an independent and locally owned bookstore in Belmont, Massachusetts. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that we have a number of virtual events coming up, including E. Lily Yu in conversation with Sam J. Miller tomorrow night, and Farah Heron launching her new book, Accidentally Engaged, with Sonali Dev and Roselle Lim on Thursday night. You can register for these and our other events on our website, which is belmontbooks.com, and that is also where you can purchase tonight's book, Fans. If you have any concerns during the presentation, you can send a message in the chat section. If you have any questions for the authors, please type them into the Q&A section and we will get to as many as we can. We're very excited to welcome Larry and Tom. I wanna to tell you a little bit about them and then I will turn the event over to them. Larry Olmsted is an award-winning journalist who has been a visiting professor at Dartmouth College, <clears throat> excuse me, where he taught nonfiction writing. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Real Food, Fake Food, and Getting Into Guinness, A History of the Guinness Book of World Records, a book for which he broke three world records himself while researching. And I definitely want to hear about that because I want to know what kind of records he broke. He currently writes online column for Forbes and USA Today, and he appears regularly on television and radio. Larry has been traveling the world as a journalist for 25 years, although not this year. He loves every kind of travel, active, cultural, and leisurely, and his special areas of expertise are luxury hotels and resorts, golf, skiing, food, wine, and spirits. Larry is an avid fan of America Ninja Warrior and a passionate fan of sports fans. He lives in Vermont. As far as he knows, award-winning writer Tom Bedell is the only member of both the Golf Writers Association of America and the North American Guild of Beer Writers. He's written extensively about both subjects and more in countless articles and in several books. Tom writes and drinks in Williamsville, Massachusetts, uh, Vermont, excuse me, unless he's on the road somewhere in the world doing the same things. He has traveled the world for magazines such as Travel and Leisure Golf, Virtuoso Life, and Golf Connoisseur. And without further ado, I will turn the event over to Larry and Tom. Larry, good to see you. It's been a while. Likewise, Tom, even though we're both in the same state. Other uh, that, that's true. I, I should say that Larry and I, though we both live in Vermont, probably not more than an hour and a half apart, have played a lot of golf together, mostly in other countries. We've, <laughs> we've, we've teamed up to lose golf matches in Ireland or Scotland, who knows where anymore, but maybe we should try playing in Vermont this summer if we get back out there. But uh, let's get to fans. Uh, we can get more specific as we go along. Uh, but let's lay down two quick markers, your basic premise and the definition of what a fan actually is. I mean, you pointedly illustrate that our entertainment culture has created a stereotype of a fan that is pretty well baked in, but simply not very accurate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things I did was take a, a pretty deep dive to look at how sports fans had been portrayed in popular media, which is mainly um, TV sitcoms and Hollywood movies. And the stereotype is pretty much universally negative uh, at best, uh, kind of lovable, obese, drunk oaf, and at worst, uh, psychotic killer. So um <laughs> Uh, neither of which are really an accurate portrayal of the average sports fan. And, you know, while I came to this from uh, a lot of other angles and reasons for doing the book, one of my goals at this point is to simply dispel that stereotype a lot of non-fans have of the sports fan. Right. Well, so just to clarify, I watch very little in the way of sporting events other than golf or baseball. I'm indifferent to basketball. I hate football. I watch no tennis or auto racing or world wrestling events, if those are even a sport. But I remain devoted to the New York Mets. So I qualify, right? Absolutely. And I, I grew up in Queens, not far from Shea Stadium. So I traced my fandom roots to that uh, very same sad and sometimes lovable team. <laughs> exactly right. Okay, well, we won't argue about the use of the Oxford comma in your book subtitle, but it's it's pretty 
clear summation of your basic premise, how watching sports makes us happier, healthier, and more understanding. Yeah, and the watching is really key because, um, I mean, sport, spectator sports is, is huge. It's arguably the biggest social framework in the world, uh, comparable to religion in some ways bigger, in some ways slightly smaller, but certainly it's global. Every country cares about sports. Billions of people around the world identify as fans. Uh, roughly 200 million people in this country identify themselves in Gallup polls as sports fans, which is you know, more than voted in our record setting presidential election for both parties combined, um, considerably more. So it's a really big part of life and, and our social fabric, yet in the media coverage, books, TV, uh, periodicals, whatever it is, the almost all of the coverage is of the athletes, the teams, the coaches, whereas the people watching make up 99.9 .9 plus percent of the total equation of participants. So I thought it was worth looking at the fans uh, and what being a fan does to us mentally, spiritually, individually, and collectively in terms of society. Yeah, because when we say health, you're talking about both physical and mental health. Yes. And, um, you know, happier includes mental health, healthier includes some mental health as well as physical health and more understanding. Um, uh, I've gotten some pushback on this because people think like I meant more understanding of bad ref calls or managerial decisions uh, in the moment. But no, I mean more understanding long term as in better, more open minded, democratic people. Yeah, OK. Uh, well, and there's also another aspect of health, I suppose we could call it well-being or even better healing that you touch on quite poignantly. And you cite a, quite a few instances, but one that stood out for me was the uh, post 9-11 stories you mentioned. Could you touch on that at all or maybe yeah. even read a bit of that section or? Absolutely. I mean, this this was personally, you know, my favorite part of the book. Um, uh, because, well, for a variety of reasons. I was more emotionally involved personally in the research for this story. I, at one point, worked in the World Trade Center. Um, uh -huh. So uh, while I was researching the book, they ran a special exhibition at the 9-11 Museum called Sport After 9-11, The Healing Power of Sport. I went, I met the curator, I went through, um, and, um, you know, that the Mets Braves game, you know, after 9-11 uh, was the first time in to modern history that all professional sport in the U.S. was shut down completely. And the last time before the current pandemic um, for about, you know, 10 days. And the Braves Mets game at Shea Stadium was the first professional sports game played in New York after 9-11. I remember it well, yeah. Everyone, everyone I've spoken to in New York, even if they're not a baseball fan, remembers it vividly. And the Mike Piazza come from behind home run has become an iconic part of baseball history. And then just four to five weeks later, the Yankees open the World Series at home where George Bush throws out the first pitch, another sort of iconic post 9-11 moment. But what really transpired was it was the first time, I mean, people were afraid. Uh, you know, we had, their city had been attacked. And this was the first time they were going back out gathering in a large number in one place and um, having a good time or trying to have a good time. And as one fan said to me, you know, it was the actually let me read. I'll read her quote because uh, it's pretty poignant. And um, uh, and people all across the country I talked to, everyone except maybe Atlanta Braves fans was rooting for the Mets. Um, and New York isn't used to getting a lot of outside support. But so one of the fans told me. That game was the moment when we went from being citizens full of rage and sorrow and anger to being fans again, when it was okay to clap again and to laugh and to smile. That's a pretty big deal. And when I asked the, uh, the curator of the 9-11 Museum about that, because he has been personally dealing with victims' families you know, for years, he told me that right. that's a sentiment he heard expressed over and over again. And, you know, several victims said the same thing. They took their kids to the, that, that game, having lost a husband or whatever. And um, did he lead you to that woman who whose story you tell so so nicely in the book? 
Yeah, so uh, Carol Gies, whose uh, husband was a, a lieutenant in the fire department who was killed right. in, in, in the Twin Towers, you know, and he coached her th their three sons in, in Little League, and she decided to take them to the game, you know, which was kind of a tough decision. Uh, but she said when that home run, you know, went over the wall, she saw her children smile for the first time since her dad had died. And that's mm -hmm. powerful stuff. And then... Um, you know, and, and this is not 9-11 is, is the highest profile sort of terrorist attack that we've had. So it stands out. But the same healing power of sports was demonstrated after Pearl Harbor and after the Boston Marathon bombing and after natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina. And probably, uh, at least before the pandemic, most recently uh, after the 1 October uh, shooting massacre in Las Vegas. Right. And, I have spent a lot of time over the years in Las Vegas. I've written a lot about a lot of different things in Las Vegas. I've been there 50 plus times. I've spent more time in Las Vegas than any other place I haven't lived. And uh, so I went out there and I interviewed locals and the mayor and uh, NHL executives and cab drivers and people who had been shot and people who had been shot at. and. Um, that to me was really the transformative moment in this whole process for me personally to buy in. Um, the, the Golden Knights are the NHL team in Las Vegas. Right. Uh, before this, Las Vegas was the largest city in the United States that did not have a team in any of the major professional sports. They got the Knights. They have no NFL team, NBA team. Well, now they have an NFL team, but they didn't then. Um, uh, MLB team. So the Knights were an extra big deal, even, you know, as a hockey team, because it was the, the only game in town. And their first game was to be played nine days after that shooting. And mm. um, the, the effect that it had, I mean, I spoke to a woman who was traumatized, had to get counseling, was afraid to leave her house. And friends invited her to go to Knights games for the first few days of the season. And she said no. And she would see it on TV and it got all this buzz and people were you know, talking about how great it was. And finally, she decided to go and she had never been to a hockey game. She was a sports fan, but she didn't watch hockey. And she went and fell in love with it and went 50 more games that season, going from afraid to leave her house to going back to the strip where the shooting had happened into a crowd over and over again. And when I talk to people like that, um, or people who had actually been shot and almost killed and have the night safe, I came away, I could no longer dismiss it as, oh, it's just sports. It's this frivolous entertainment. It's, it's got an incredible power. And so that's a long winded answer. Well, was that what originally brought you into this idea in the first place or? No, uh, I actually came at this from the opposite direction. I went to uh, a game at Fenway Park and saw some Red Sox fans with their kids, uh, very young kids, dressed in t-shirts with obscenities directed at the Yankees. And uh, I remember thinking, you know, what's, what's wrong with these people? You know, to dress their kids up with, with these things I can't even say uh, here on Zoom. And, um, and it bothered me after the game. And I like Fenway Park, it's historic, it's a great place to see baseball. But for days afterwards, this kind of image haunted me of, of these people. And finally, I decided, you know, maybe there's something in sports fandom that makes us bad people or makes us crazy. And that's sort of why I started doing this research into psychology of sports fans. And I very quickly saw that that gut feeling I had was 100% wrong. Um, right, right. And, and the reason why they stood out was because they were the, the outliers. The, there were, you know, 40 something thousand other people at the game that day who I don't remember who didn't haunt my memories because they are normal, well-adjusted fans. And one of the sports psychologists I talked talk to said, you know, in every group, there's, you know, undesirable people. And if it's half of a percent or one of a percent, one percent, and you've got gatherings of 50,000 people, well, that's going to be a couple of hundred people at each game. And so when you think of like the, the, the person yelling that you wish you weren't seated next to whatever, those are, those are the exceptions. And, and now, and this was years ago, but in today's super contentious society that we live in, uh, I look back and, and I looked at scientific data and it changed my mind about a belief. And I'm particularly proud of that because nobody seems to do that anymore. Well, it's the same thing like soccer hooliganism. So that would be an outlier situation. 
Even yeah, and um, you know the that book, how soccer explains the world. Uh, it's a, quite a few years old now, but it was a big bestseller, Francis Four, and it um, delves into that a lot. And and soccer hooli hooliganism was largely eliminated from the Premier League and uh, and cracked down at the high levels. But where it really thrives is in the sort of you know semi broken Eastern European countries with crumbling stadiums, where the stadiums have become more. Of a, of a place for violence gangs to gather than, than a soccer venue. And, um, you know, it still hangs on, unfortunately, but that's probably the worst image of, of fandom. Yeah, okay. Well, and it's, uh, you know, the year we've been living in, uh, a strange year roiled by the pandemic, severe division in the country along political lines. Um, so we think of sports, though, as usually more of a uniting than a dividing force. So why do we get more benefits from being a sports fan than being a Democrat or Republican <laughs> or, or a Harry Potter fan or a Harry Styles fan? Yeah, well, I will say, I mean, having just watched the Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago, I felt like the announcers were being paid for a bonus for how many times they could use the words unity and community in the broadcast. <laughs> they really kind of beat it home, the point. But um. No, that's interesting because uh, one of my editors, you know, who's not a sports fan said, yeah, you know, I understand why being a fan and feeling like you belong to this group is, is positive mentally, but how is that different from Harry Potter or any other kind of fandom? Um, and it turns out it's quite a bit different in, in several notable ways. Um, hmm. So the biggest, you know, these sports psychologists have identified, or psychologists in general who research fans have identified about two dozen what they call distinct mental health benefits of sports fandom versus that sports fans enjoy higher levels of than the rest of the population. And these are things like lower rates of depression, higher self esteem, uh, larger circles of friends, better social connectivity. But to me, they all they're somewhat overlapping and they all kind of fall under this uh, feeling of belonging to a community. And we are, uh, it's in our DNA. Humans are innately tribal. Since the stone age, we have chosen to live together in groups and form villages and communities and city states and countries. Um, and when we do have, you know, the odd person who really chooses that it would be better to separate themselves from society and live in a cabin in the woods and you have the Unabomber. So, so, uh, you know, we generally crave belonging to a group or a tribe and um, sports provides that in a really meaningful way that a lot of other entertainment doesn't. And one thing I came to realize is in sports, we use this term fairly regularly, fill in the blank team name nation. Right, Red Sox Nation, Packers Nation, but you never hear anyone say Harry Styles Nation. And there's nothing wrong with Harry Styles, but the thing is that you know it speaks to how uh, developed the community of sports fans is that it's comparable to its own nation. And the reasons why it's different include the fact that when you watch a game on TV, at least not during the pandemic, uh, there's 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60,000 people in your view, almost the entire game, many of whom are wearing your team's jerseys. And when you set out to watch a football game, you don't think of it as setting out to watch other spectators. You think you're just watching a football game, but you can't help but notice subconsciously that those people are in the frame all the time. And that's why when sports fans are interviewed, even when they're home alone on the couch watching, they feel like they're part of the event, part of the game, part of something larger than themselves. And like I'm a Star Wars fan, but if I watch a Star Wars movie on TV, I don't feel like I'm part of any kind of audience. And yes, I can go to a convention or participate in fandom in other ways, but it's not in your face all the time. And it's not just when you watch sports, it's uh, when you go to the supermarket and you walk down the aisle of your supermarket in Brattleboro and you see someone in a Red Sox or a Bruins jersey and maybe you have one on, you probably don't, but someone does. And uh, one NHL executive called this, described this to me and they said, they call it the head nod. You see this stranger, you think eyes, you acknowledge each other and you now have a connection simply because you're wearing that and you would, potentially get the same connection if you had your Metallica shirt on and you saw another Metallica fan, but that doesn't happen very much compared to sports logo wear. And sports fans are also kind of unique in that they like to put bumper stickers on their cars. 
but you don't see I see, you know, Red Sox bumper stickers, Patriots bumper stickers, Yankees suck bumper stickers all the time, but I don't ever see a Star Wars bumper sticker. Um, I think you you were you were ready to make an exception for the Grateful Dead, I think. I was. I, I, I believe that uh, of all the forms of other entertainment, being a deadhead is the most similar to being a sports fan. The problem being you can no longer reap those benefits because you can't go see the Grateful Dead, but you can turn on your TV right now and I guarantee there's sports on. Um, so, you know, that's part of this. It, it's, it's all around us. We see it all the time. We feel we belong to these groups. And, um, and also there's the immediacy of sports as entertainment. We watch it almost exclusively live or slightly delayed on your DVR, because if you find out what happens, it kind of ruins it for you. It's unpredictable, right. which brings everyone together on the edge of their seat. Whereas, you know, if I go to see the Star Wars movie, I know nine movies later, the good guys are going to win. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, in a short review I wrote of the book, I mentioned I was getting ready to toss it across the room because I felt early on you were kind of front loading the positive argument for fandom. But but you do get down to some counter arguments, thanks to what you call a Socratic conversation held largely on a ski lift with a doctor who considers herself a non-fan. And, and I was curious, how much of this is a construct versus what actually happened? Uh, well, the doctor is a real friend of mine and I did uh, go skiing with her in Jackson, Wyoming. And I was sort of at this impasse where I had all the, most of the research done, but I hadn't figured out how to structure it. And I, you know, as you tend, when you work on projects, you get wrapped up almost uh, this dilemma of knowing too much about the subject that you can't see it objectively. And so not being a sports fan, she asked me a few of those questions. And she said, the key being, you know, oh, I see why are you writing this book? I see it as a big waste of time. Um, so, uh, you know, sports, being a sports fan. So some of those things led me to think like, oh, yeah, this is how someone who does not relate, does not have the information I have is going to look at the problem and that would be a good way to structure it. So no, not every question in there happened during our one day conversation, but some of them, the most important ones did, and it was, uh, was the impetus. And, and I still, uh, I get asked a lot of the same questions every time I talk to a non-sports fan. Okay. And uh, speaking of questions, uh, participants who are watching, there's a Q&A button down at the bottom. Please throw a question our way and we'll, we'll feed it to Larry. Actually, I do have one here already, Larry. Okay. It's, uh, not sure exactly who this came from, but it, uh, I know you do mention in this book and it's kind of like your brain on sports. And this question is, I'm wondering if in the research, the author determined if there is a difference if you follow a perennial losing team, if the results are still good. Yeah, so that's a question I get asked a lot. And uh, the answers are is yes, but there's two different levels to it. So, you know, in in sports, there's a few, you know, dynastic teams that win a lot more than other teams. There's a few teams that are at the opposite end of the spectrum that are really kind of perennial losers. And then there's most teams which are in the middle and over time, most teams in most sports are kind of average. And um, as one of the sports psychologists explained it to me, we have a sort of circuit breaker in our head so that when you, your team wins, especially a big game, your upside joy that you can get from that event is basically limitless, especially if it, you know it's the Super Bowl and or their, the World Series or their first one in a long time. But when they lose, you can only get so disappointed. So you know if if it's a hundred point scale, you might get a hundred from that World Series win, but you get a twenty when they lose the World Series. You don't get a zero because they were still there. You enjoyed it. Plus, you know as they say, if, if one sports psychologist said, if if sports fans didn't have a coping mechanism, there would be no sports fans. Um, you know, only one team wins the World Series. Only one team wins the Super Bowl, right? Most of the fans would go home happy. So anyway, the upside of that is if your team is 50-50 over time or even 40-60, you come out ahead because you get more out of the wins than you lose in the losses. And in addition to that, the, 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 
the wins last longer and the losses fade away. You know what I say? Time heals all wounds. Uh, I remember when the Mets won in 1986, right? The World Series, fairly right. vividly, but I don't remember the 1992 season, you know, um, or a lot of the years in between. And but, but you know, living here in Red Sox Nation, they still remember the 86 World Series. They do. And there are, you know, there are certain losses that are more painful. However, that would be far more painful had the Red Sox then never won. The Red Sox... Right validated their fans to the point where they can now you know let go to some degree of 1986 uh, <laughs> um but and forget and forgive bill buckner actually yes but um but then there's the really bad teams like i remember when the saints fans used to wear paper bags over their heads to the games that was a big thing uh to remain anonymous and um, but the Cubs are probably, you know, the big example. They lost for so long that a lot of their fans had never seen them win. And right. at that point, uh, a lot of the fans take extra pride in being fans because there's no Johnny come lately. There's no jump on the bandwagon. Your part of your fan persona is that you're willing to, to tough that out. And I actually spoke to some longtime Cubs fans who had mixed emotions when they finally won because they were happy they finally won, but it took something away from what made being a Cubs fan special. Yeah. Interesting. Here's a question from uh, Neil Rohr. Did you do any research as to the downsides of being a sports fan? Are there any? Yeah. I mean, as I said, there's, there's the, the, always people who in, in any pursuit that are going to take things too far. And that can be simply spending too much time. Um, you know, I talk about, you know, sports, sports being a gateway in some ways to being more active and doing other things. But, you know, if all you do with every waking hour is sit in front of the TV, that is not particularly healthy. And then, you know, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, um, being a sports fan has become fairly expensive, at least if you want to actually go to games. Um, in a lot of sports, prohibitively expensive. And so, you know, when people, you know, especially maybe season ticket holders who've had their tickets for a long time have to keep poning up more and more money. And, uh, you know, the Miller Lite there is $18 and, you know, they want to buy a jersey. Um, I think, you know, people can tend, you know, to spend money that they can't afford to spend on it. And then there are people who, you know, get really down about the losing and, and can't get past that the way most sports fans can. So, you know, if it's if for most sports fans, the activity makes them happier. But if it doesn't, then you probably shouldn't be a sports fan. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the uh, participatory effect of fandom, meaning watching sports can stimulate us to get off our own backsides. And speaking of golf certainly true in that case. Yeah, absolutely. And this is was one of the hardest things to research because, you know, the, they, they survey sports fans and they say, OK, they're more active in general than the rest of the population. But part of that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You played Little League, you played high school football. So you are a sports fan, but you were maybe active to begin with or or maybe sports fans pre-selects people who are interested in being active. So I tried to really look for examples of ways that directly uh, sedentary spectators were transformed into being more physically active by watching sports, because that's really where the advantage to society lies, especially when we have an obesity, obesity epidemic and, and other problems. And, and, and there are a number of examples of that. Um, Lance Armstrong drove a huge surge in cycling that continues to this day in all these charity rides that did not exist before all over the country. Um, the Olympics every two years, used to be every four years, it's better for us now, it's every two years, there's a surge in gym memberships and fitness pursuits because people see that. Now, like New Year's resolutions, some of that goes away, but some of it sticks. But golf to me is really interesting because uh, it truly transformed the entire sport in a way um, when, and you and I know this because we've written a lot about golf, but most people don't. And in 1913, um, Francis Wimet, who was the, you know, a caddy at Brookline, uh, son of a handyman, won the U.S. Open. Um, at a time when, when golf was exclusively a rich person's country club private sport. 
and it captivated the nation, most of whom you know couldn't care less about golf before that. Um, right. And immediately afterwards, the next year, uh, um, Walter Travis, another kind of blue collar guy comes along and he wins the US Open and then the British Open. And then Bobby Jones shows up, who's an amateur. And this is like a perfect storm of America being mesmerized by a sport they knew nothing about and largely had no access to. So at the time when Francis Wimet wins the US Open, there's about 500 golf courses in the United States and almost all of them are private. So you're watching this, you can't really do anything, but suddenly people want to play golf. And by the end of the 20s, when Bobby Jones retires, there's 6,000 courses and 80% of them are public. And that's why people play golf today. I mean, it, it, they got literally, they didn't watch it because it wasn't on TV. They read about it. They heard it on the radio, but they were fascinated enough to go out and try it. And a whole new participant sport is born. We have the Masters coming up. And I would argue the Masters wouldn't even exist if that, those three guys hadn't played in in that close succession and golf would be the equivalent of dressage or yachting regattas today it would be a, you know a fringe sport played by a handful of rich people uh and you know golf has lingered that reputation for being a sort of elitist sport but as you and i know from some of the places we play in vermont you can go out there in your car hearts and your t-shirt and and um, and you know, the actual cost of playing golf in most of the country is pretty low. So I, I find right. that really interesting. Our whole, our whole sport we love wouldn't even exist if it weren't for spectators getting interested. And it is, you mentioned the masters, which of course, uh, contributes to the elitist attitude. Some people still have about golf and yet public golf is 75 to 80% of golf played in the U S yeah. anybody can do it. So, well, uh, well, a friend of mine, Jerry Carboni, is obviously watching. He's got an interesting one here for you. Sports has always been a way for immigrants to acculturate to American society. My father, an Italian immigrant, always rooted for the Yankees because of the number of Italian Americans on the team. Do you think this still happens among new immigrants to the country? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, because there's only so many groups, you know, that break through that the first time but where it's transformed more is um you know back in the day especially baseball was a place where you know the first jewish stars the first italian stars and certainly uh, jackie robinson um you know broke these barriers today that progress in sports has transformed more towards other movements so the it's sports fandom played a really big role in the civil rights movement and then it played a big role in the women's rights movement. And today it plays a big role in the LGBTQ movement and, and even more recently, the social justice movement. So I think that that transformative effect, uh, that's what I talk about when I say more understanding, how sports makes us you know, more understanding, more open-minded, more of an accepting society. And it started you know, with immigrants and minority groups, but it continues to address all sort of others in our society. Yeah. What about the downside of emulation? You did mention, uh, I think what you call in the book, the Lance Armstrong effect, the bad model. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, there, there's certainly been a lot of athletes who are not good role models and, you know, it's understandable. I mean, not all athletes set out to be role models, not all want to be role models. And again, when you have, you know, a couple of thousand people doing something that, you know, they're not all going to be great role models, but Lance Armstrong was particularly interesting because he did, he did so much good, but then he was disgraced. And yet, you know, he has fans that I talk to who don't care, you know, that he essentially cheated and disgraced his sport. So, you know, I think that's unfortunate, but I do think the fact that, uh, you know, when I look at it again, from the, the public health wellness benefit, all of these 100 mile 50 mile charity rides all over the country which in then in turn began an expansion of 5k and 10k fun runs right so a lot of this traces back those people who weren't previously biking who now get inspired to do a 100 mile charity ride it's not like they just get on their bike one day and they ride 100 miles they have to train for that they go to the gym they do shorter rides they they are exercise more regularly and, and a lot of that across the board traces back to Lance Armstrong and how he popularized you know people in Europe always love cycling they love the Tour de France they watched it no one here really cared yeah 
I'm sure this is all why you and I are in such great shape. There's no question about it. <laughs> well, no, I was, I was, I personally experienced this uh, in a very Bostonian way. Um, a friend of mine watched the Boston Marathon, which, you know, we know it's on Patriots Day and it's a big deal, but, you know, people in, in, in a lot of other parts of the country can't understand how big a deal the Boston Marathon is because the Cincinnati Marathon isn't that big a deal in comparison. Um, but a friend of mine watched it on TV, and this is like 20 years ago, and she said, you know what, why don't we try running? I had never run, and we started with like two miles. And I ended up you know, running several marathons and dozens of half marathons and running regularly was a big part of my life till I had knee surgery um, uh, for years. And so, and, and I would say, you know, made the quality of my life better and may never have happened had it not been for sports on TV. There you go. Uh, I wouldn't normally ask a question from an uh, anonymous attendee, but this is a beauty. <laughs> Are sports fans more or less happily married? Um, so they have, uh, lower divorce rates. Um, it's hard to say, you know, how, how happy they are actually are at home. But, uh, earlier today, um, I was on a, a radio live radio in Wisconsin and a woman called in with a question. And she said that she was a lifelong bears fan and her husband was a lifelong Packers fan. And that, you know, it gave them something to sort of, you know, I guess they say opposites to track, I was I was impressed with that. You know, they had a long, happy marriage. So uh, and 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 mo and a lot of uh, married couples probably support the same team. So, you know, if the Bears and Packers fans can get along, we all can. Well, you mentioned some statistics and um, I mean, I think your next book should probably be on time management, gauging by the number of medical and scientific studies you've obviously dug up for this book. And because you've always been the Isaac Asimov of the magazine world anyway, I should say Larry has written more articles than there are grains of sand on a beach. But uh, you, you talk about some of the uh, trips you took to the, the museum and out to Las Vegas, but could you talk a little bit about the research, other research you had to do for the book? Yeah, I mean, there's um, a small but recently growing uh, niche within psychology and then within sports psychology that's studying fandom. I mean, most sports psychologists are about improving your performance in sports. That's when we say sports psychologists, that's what we think of. Um, right. But just as I mentioned, you know, how many, how big fandom is and how little it's been looked at, it has been receiving, you know, a lot more attention. And I mean, everything from, you know, people taking uh, swabs at stadiums to test your testosterone to wiring people's brains to MRIs and you know imaging them while they watch sports. Um, so there's a lot of different paths and I, I spoke to a lot of those psychologists and there was an, uh, an uh, annual forum that I went to in Bowling Green, Kentucky, where a lot of these sports psychologists come together and read papers. So I got a chance to sort of meet with a bunch of them in one place, which you know made my life a little bit easier logistically. Um, but the thing is that, uh, the re you know, the, the research into sports tends to attract people who are surprised sports fans. Uh, so they tend there as a whole, were very eager to talk about this with me, which again, you know, compared to some interviews made my life a lot easier though, you know, it was a lot, a lot of trips and a lot of interviews and a lot of emails and back and forth and phone calls and, the hardest part for me was reading some of these scientific papers because they use a lot of math I can't comprehend. <laughs> what are they actually trying to find out? I mean, what, what drives them to study fans in the first place, I guess? Well, one, there's a, a, a doctor who recurs in my book, Dr. Daniel Wan, um, right. uh, who is probably the leader in this field in this country, if not the world. And he was originally working on an unrelated project. And, you know, they always ask these questions, kind of a, a pantheon or a slate of questions to try to, you know, get a baseline of, of the people who fill out the surveys. And he noticed this odd relationship between people who said that they were sports fans and increased sign mental health ratings. Um, so he decided to sort of pursue that and has for the rest of his career. I think he, you know, kind of noticed it as a grad student. And, um, and it's probably the most, to me, the most humorous part of the book is, um, you know, I try to, to, to 
show how some of these studies are done. And then I asked Dr. Wan what the most interesting study he ever did, because he's done hundreds of them. Uh, and it was a, a study of sports fan superstitions. And once I saw the results of this, these surveys, I couldn't help but include them in the book because, um, you know, it doesn't give you a lot of maybe useful insights, but it certainly gives you a, a, a big chuckle. And, and you know, a, you're, you're a beer guy. So, you know, I wonder what you think of, you know, the Notre Dame fan who has to read three Bible passages and chug three beers before every quarter of every football game. I'll go along with the beer. I don't know about the Bible, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> whatever works, I suppose, is the answer there. Uh, Steve Peranio, hope I didn't mangle that too much, Steve, uh, says, my worst fan experience was being at Fenway where people were screaming and swearing at A-Rod when he'd come back from after his steroid suspension. There were kids in the stands hearing this. It was sad. What are your thoughts on this? Is there a term for this rage and hatred from the fandom? Um, I mean, I, I think that that's unfortunate. I think, you, you know, there you have kind of this compounding of factors, which are that the Red Sox fans historically dislike the Yankees most. You have a player who, you know, essentially was seen as cheating um, and who was the highest paid player in the game. So, you know, begged uh, the kind of highest level of fan disdain you could get. Still not an excuse for that kind of behavior. Um, but again, that, that is not the norm. That may have been the norm for that game. But if you went back to see a uh, Red Sox game the next day and they were playing the twins, I don't think that would have happened. Okay. All right. Uh, I got some lightning round questions here for you, but I think before we run out of time, we better answer Stacy's question. Tell us about the Guinness world records you set. Oh, um, off the subject a bit. Uh, well, yeah, not so, really, because I know one of them involved golf. Yeah, they. I mean, um, at the time, I had this idea to write a book about the history of of the Guinness Book of Records, and I wanted to kind of uh, uh, borrow a page um, from Paper Lion and you know some of those participatory sports books, and put myself through the process of record setting to see what it was like. Um, and I set my mind on breaking a golf record and I'm not a good golfer, but I am a very experienced traveler. So I found this obscure record on the greatest distance traveled between two rounds of golf played in the same day. And it was like 5,000 something miles. So I sat down with maps and schedules and the timeline and determined that if I played around in Sydney, Australia, I could make a flight to LA and gain back enough daylight to play again. And it would be 7,496 miles and shatter that mark, um, which I did. And then uh, it was sort of fun and it got a lot of press on its own for the book. So then I did two more and one was uh, the longest marathon poker playing session, which I did at Foxwoods down in Connecticut. And sure. the final one was uh, skiing, the most different trails skied in eight hours. And skiing is a sport that I'm actually good at. So I finally got around to something I, in my wheelhouse. <laughs> okay, very good. That was your first book, followed by Real Food, Fake Food. Yep. And, uh, you know, there are three very different topics, but what they have in common and the same thing that my journalistic work has been is I go around and I look for interesting ideas that I think haven't been told. And that's what I found with fans. Okay. All right. Let's, I'm going to fire a couple of short, short ones here at, well, we already did your brain and sports. Uh, well, I was going to say you have to answer in 30 words or fewer, but we still got 15 minutes. So you do what you like. Fantasy leagues. Yes. So uh, a big change, relatively new, super fast growing. I said uh, a little less than 200 million people in, in the country identify themselves as sports fans. About 60 million people in the U.S. and Canada play fantasy sports. So a, a pretty you know substantial subset. And the difference being that one of the unlikable things about sports fans has long been the tribalism, the I hate the Yankees, I hate the Red Sox, I hate whoever simply because of where they live. And with fantasy sports, the participants no longer have that luxury because if they want to win, they have to have the best players from all of the teams on their team. And uh, 
it's already, this is again, something some of these psychologists have studied and determined that the, the fan attitude towards hated players is softened quite a bit. And I think that's a really good thing, but uh, quickly, the other good, great thing about fantasy sports, it connects people. A lot of people play in multiple leagues with a theme, like people at the job I used to work at, people I went to college with. It's just another form of, of social network connectivity like Facebook or something. And it's a very good multi-generational tool. I look at father, son, mother, daughter, team management, co-captainship as replacing Scrabble, Monopoly, gin rummy around the kitchen table. Very good. Sports bars. Sports bars I find fascinating because, you know, when you want, you think about like quintessential conversation starters, you've got like the weather politics right but there's no weather bars and there's no politics bars and then you know entertainment there's there are music bars you can go to a jazz club or something but there's no movie bars or sitcom bars or opera bars but yet there's hundreds of sports bars all around the world and you can walk into any of those when you're on the road and sit down and have a beer and look up at the tv and start talking to the person next to you regardless of their age, race, uh, educational background, profession, and have a, a delightful conversation. So I find that a really interesting phenomena. And I discovered there is a progenitor of the modern sports bar, a place in California that was the first to kind of put up all the kitschy theme stuff and get satellite TV. But before that, even back in like the 30s, people would go to bars and listen to the baseball game on a radio just to be together. Right. I wonder if they're like our version of the Irish pub where people get together with, you know, just inherent friendliness. Yeah. And I, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the British Isles. It's one of the things I mentioned in the book is I'll go into a pub in Ireland or Scotland and there'll be either uh, in, invariably either snooker or cricket on, both of which I know nothing about. And I will have a lengthy conversation in which a friendly local explains everything there is to know about it. And then for some reason, when I wake up the next day, I never remember and it starts all over again. <laughs> Groundhog Day. Uh, Tokyo 2021. Um, so, I mean, you know, I'd like to see the Olympics come off if it's not safe. You know, I understand that. Um, but I'm personally, I'm a big fan of Japan. I, I've traveled there quite a bit. I think it would be a great place to have it. They certainly spent a lot of money on it. It would be nice for them to recoup some of that. But to me, the uh, the big thing about the Olympics, as I said, is, you know, it, it, it in a unique way inspires people to become active. And what, some of the uh, data shows that what really affects people is when they see sports that they're not used to watching. So typically the new sports that premiere at the Olympics. Now, last time we had golf, which isn't, you know, it's new to the Olympics, but it's not new to the viewer. But for Tokyo 2021, the two new sports are surfing and rock climbing, both of which are going to make really good adrenaline action-packed tv that a lot of people haven't seen and they're both relatively accessible you can take a two-hour learn to surf lesson at any beach resort in the world and you can and the climbing that they're going to be doing is indoor gym climbing which you could do in any major city so i think those sports stand to really benefit in terms of people getting interested in them and if it doesn't come off they're going to be in paris you know anyway so sooner or later surfing and rock climbing will get their due okay here's your miss america question world peace sports and world peace yeah so that that's probably one of the topics that surprised me the most when i did the research um and that being said, I had read um, uh, the book Playing the Enemy, which is about how Nelson Mandela used rugby to avoid civil war post-apartheid and heal South Africa. So, and that's probably the most pointed use of sports fandom as a tool for peace. And I was already familiar with that. And I've been to South Africa a few times and I actually interviewed somebody who was at the game. Um, they made a movie about it, Invictus with Matt Damon. Invictus, and, right. Um, but it's a true story and that's that's a very clear example but there's a lot of other examples i interviewed ambassadors and diplomats and people from the state department and the un about how sports fandom is routinely used in the nation building um bridging civil divides the peace process and and to me you know it's fascinating and along with the healing the post traumatic healing this is why even if you're not a sports fan 
you should read this book and learn how sports fandom makes the world around you a better place and makes your life better, even if you could care less about the game. Well, I think you just answered the question that came in here on the chat. Uh, someone said, I don't know why I can't type in the Q&A, so I'll ask this here. Are the positive effects on sports fans strong enough that someone who has no interest in sports should try to find one to be a fan of? I would say no, because you're going to... <laughs> You're getting those benefits, even if you don't become a sports fan. So you're not maybe that the happiness benefits. No, but if you become an artificial fan and it doesn't make you happy, you're not going to get those anyway. But you are still reaping the benefits of, you know, of a more enlightened society and peace around the world. And, you know, the other thing is that that we get from sports fandom. But, you know, it's all on the other hand, there are so many sports. It's hard to imagine somebody who can't find some enjoyment in one of them. And, you know, I have this chapter on American Ninja Warrior as an idea, as a, you know, a sport that I love that was created out of whole cloth and is relatively new. And I had no expectation. I never, you know, saw it growing up because it didn't exist. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, maybe if you don't like football, you could wrap your head around that. Well, and as you said, the best thing to do would be to pick up a copy of the book and read it. That's the whole thing. <laughs> Larry, this has been great. Uh, I think I'm pretty well out of questions. Uh, the only other thing I might ask, I mean, you actually have a few instances of people who are suffering some kind of disease in the book and latch on to watching sports or identifying with a sports fan and if not curing them, at least comforting them. Yeah, and I wouldn't make the argument that, you know, sports is going to cure your cancer or watching sports, but I certainly talk to cancer victims who use sports as a way to manage their treatment, their rehabilitation, um, basically to emotionally get through this. And that whole idea of, you know, staying in the fight and, you know, winners never quit and the example of, you know, how, how much time professional athletes spend to maintaining their physical condition applies to also people who are trying to overcome a malady. Right. Well, we do have one new message here. Let's see what we got up. Oh, Stacy's back. Well, that's okay. If you have, if you have another question there. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it uh, crosses into that dangerous field of politics. Will golf fandom oh, ever okay. recover, ever recover from Trump? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, I think his personal association with the game has given it an odd twist, but, you know, the, the powers that be in the sport have chosen you know, not to hold events at his properties that they were going to do. And I think that will probably help it sort of slide in this issue, slide into the sunset. Right. Okay. Well, let's end on a positive note. The book is fans. The author is Larry Olmstead. Thanks for the time, Larry. It's been good. good Thanks, Tom. You're a great host. Thank you guys both so much. It was really nice meeting you both. Larry, we're so thrilled that you would that you did our your launch with us, and we wish you the best with your new book and hope that you get to travel soon. And to everybody who came out tonight, thank you so much for coming, and we hope to see you at the next event. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>